We have gotten used to simple clearances, direct radar vectors to join an airway, charted SIDs. It's rare to get instructions to fly to a radial distance fix, but it does happen, and we are going to look at a fairly common one for piston aircraft flying from Winston-Salem, North Carolina, to Charlotte International. We'll see how we might enter it into four different navigators by creating a user waypoint. We will look at the Garmin GNS 530, the G1000, the Garmin GTN 750, and the Avidyne IFD 540. Here is our clearance. Clear to the Charlotte Airport via direct to the Greensboro 240 degree radial 7 mile fix. Direct magic, direct. Maintain 2,000, expect 6,000 10 minutes after departure. We will begin with our old school GNS 530. We are on the ground at Winston-Salem, so that is pre-filled for us. The easiest way to create a user waypoint in the GNS is to enter the name of a waypoint which doesn't exist in the database. Although we can use anything, I like to be consistent and use a key sequence I already know will not be in the database. I use USR and a number. I enter USR1, and since there is no such waypoint already in the database, the system asks me if I want to create a user waypoint. A yes gets us into the creation window. You can see that the system defaults to our present position. If you check it out, you will see that 13 miles from Greensboro VOR on the 297 degree radial is on the ground at Winston-Salem Airport. It is also where the Greensboro 297 radial intersects with the Liberty 306 degree radial. All we need to do now is cursor up to Greensboro and enter the information directly from our clearance. No interpretation is necessary. We enter the Greensboro 240 degree radial and seven miles. As we do this, you will see the Liberty Crossing radial and the latitude longitude display automatically recalculate. If we were to be given a fix made up of two crossing radials, we would enter the two radials and let the distance and lat lon calculate themselves. Enter through the remaining windows and OK the creation of the waypoint. Our flight plan is populated with our user waypoint. Next, we enter Magic Intersection and finally the Charlotte Airport. Once we do that, we can verify our route to see if it makes sense by heading to the map pages. We are ready to go. We next move to the G1000. We are using the one from the Diamond DA40 XLS, in part because it is one of the older G1000s in terms of software release. So later G1000 units will have at least this functionality. As before, we start on the ground at Winston-Salem. As with Garmin navigators in general, one way to create a user waypoint is to enter the name of a waypoint which doesn't exist in the flight plan. I'll use my standard USR1. No such waypoint exists in the database, so the system prompts me to create one. A yes gets us into the creation window. Again, the Garmin defaults to our present position, this time based on radial and distance, rather than cross radials. We could, if we needed to, change that to cross radials or to latitude and longitude. Since our waypoint is radial and distance, we will use it. We change the radial to 240 and the distance to 7 nautical miles per hour clearance. Nice in the G1000 is that as we enter the information, it displays it on the map as a reality cross check. Enter through the remaining windows. OK the creation of the waypoint, and add it to our flight plan. We complete the flight plan with Magic Intersection and the Charlotte Airport, do a final reality check on the map, and we are ready to call for taxi. Here is the GTN 750. The 650 is half the size, but like the other units which come in two sizes, the difference is screen size and scrolling, not capability. Again, we start on the ground at Winston-Salem. Although a more sophisticated touchscreen unit, 
The GTN follows the same logic of allowing us to create a user waypoint by entering the name of one which does not exist in the database. As with the others, I enter user 1 and am prompted to create the waypoint. In the creation window, the GTN follows the Garmin default of pre-entering our present position. In this unit, the default is latitude-longitude, so we will change it to radial distance to enter our waypoint. Greensboro is there, so we only need to enter the 240 degree radial and the 7 nautical mile distance. Tapping Create pops it into our flight plan. As we add Magic Intersection and the Charlotte Airport, one difference from the other Garmin units we looked at, many users don't notice. The GNS and G1000 require us to enter all the characters. The GTN incorporates Garmin's Fast Find, which predicts what we are looking for using a combination of the letters we enter and our location. We will see a similar concept in action in the Avidyne IFD. A final reality check on the map, and we are done in no more time than it takes to load an approach. For our Avidyne, we will use the IFD 540. Same capability in the smaller 440 and the Synthetic Vision 550. One difference from the Garmin units we looked at is the IFD does not prompt us to enter a user waypoint by entering an unknown into the flight plan. The Avidyne will not accept it. Before we leave this screen, though, we can also see Avidyne's geofill feature in operation. On every screen where we enter waypoint information, Avidyne units will prompt for the nearest. Here it defaults to the Greensboro VOR, the nearest VOR to our location. In later screens, watch for how it predicts what we want early in the entry sequence. In any event, we need to tab over to the waypoint screen to enter our user waypoint. You can create a user waypoint in the Garmin units by going this route too, but unless you are going to enter a series of them, there doesn't seem to be much reason to do that. From there, the flow is familiar with several differences. The Avidyne pre-fills a default waypoint name, as will the later Garmin units, if you follow this route. We will accept it. The IFD presents us with a latitude-longitude default based on our current location. When we change to radial distance, the current location disappears, but as we begin to enter the information, we will see geofill in operation. It pre-fills Winston-Salem Airport, where we are sitting on the ground. As soon as we enter the letter G, it predicts we are intending Greensboro VOR. We complete creating the user waypoint. Since we did not begin our user waypoint directly from the flight plan, the IFD does not automatically assume we want to add it there. We could go to the flight plan and enter the new waypoint like any other, but since it is our next waypoint, it's simpler to hit direct, return to the flight plan, and we'll see it there. As we enter Magic Intersection and the Charlotte Airport, you'll see Geofill in operation again. Although in some cases, just entering the letters and numbers is easier, consider its value with an en route amendment adding a five-letter fix you never heard of before. As usual, a final reality check on the map, and we are on our way. Thank you for watching. Your comments, both good and bad, are more than welcome.